a great help in the house. They helped me out. I'm, I'm truly. <laughs> in the nick of time. Highly favored. Ooh, I'm here. Okay, it is 7.01 and we are ready to get started. Good evening, everyone. My name is Anupam Chiksidhu. Welcome to the May 26, 2020 regular meeting of the Board of Education of Plymouth Canton Community Schools. It is great to see all of my colleagues and district staff virtually. It is especially great to see Member Savage joining us for this remote meeting. I'm so glad you could join us. Welcome back. Thank you. If you're watching the live stream, thank you for joining us remotely. Before we get started, I wanna remind the public that if anyone would like to share a citizen's comment, please fill out the online form that is available on the website. Please type your comments into the form and they will be read out loud by one of the board members during the citizen comment portion of the agenda. We will adhere to the three minute limit for each citizen's comment. With that, I would like to have my board colleagues introduce themselves in alphabetical order. Member Bernanski. Yes. I uh, muted myself instead of unmuted. Um, good evening, everyone. Uh, it's nice to see everyone virtually. I hope that everyone is staying safe and everyone is healthy. Thank you for joining us. Hey, good evening, everybody. My name is Doug Brooks. Uh, I want everybody to make sure they listen to what we have going on tonight. It's uh, going to be good um, for everyone. Thanks. Good evening, Patrick Kehoe. Uh, good evening, Patrick Kehoe. Thanks for uh, for joining us uh, uh, virtually. I do miss seeing you in person, and I can't wait till we get to the day when we can have that happen again. Member Lazarowitz. Good evening. Hi, I'm John Lazarowitz. Thank you for coming and watching. Member McQuine. Uh, Patty McQuine, thank you so much for being here. It was a beautiful day today. Great day to be outdoors. Member Savage. Good evening, it's good to be back. Um, please excuse the clutter behind me, but I hope you can still see me well. Thank you. <laughs> Members to do. Thank you, um, I've done my introduction. So now I would like to have Ms. Merritt, uh, please introduce your staff. Good evening and welcome and uh, Trustee Savage, it's so great to see you again. Um, I'm glad you're here, part of our meeting this evening. I hope everyone enjoyed your Memorial Day. Um, I'd like to begin by introducing my assistant, Miss Diane Robertson, and I wanna thank her for taking our minutes for our meeting. And I would like to ask the remaining members of the staff to introduce themselves to you, beginning with Mr. Brandon. Good evening, everyone. Thanks for tuning in. Nick Brandon, Executive Director of Communications and Marketing. Hope everyone's doing well. Hi, I'm Debbie Piaz. I'm the Chief Finance and Operations Officer. This is Liz Vartanian Gibbs, Human Resources. Good evening, Liz Vartanian Gibbs, Human Resources. Debbie, you want to go? I did before Liz, but I'll do it again. Okay, I'm, the Chief, I'm the Chief Finance and Operations Officer. Good evening. Good evening, Kurt Siskut's Executive Director of Student Services. Thanks for joining us tonight. Good evening, Beth Rail, Chief Academic Officer. Thanks for watching us live and being here, those of you who are together. Good evening, Heather Fitchpatrick, President, Education Association. Thank you for joining us. Did we get everyone? Okay, great. Um, at this point, uh, we will rise for the Pledge of Allegiance and uh, Member McCoyne is going to lead that for us and the rest of us will stay silent in order to avoid the overlapping of the voices. So let's rise. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. And this was actually a recommendation from someone that was watching our board meetings and said that when we were all 
reciting the pledge, it just had a lot of overlapping voices and it was hard to comprehend and listen and hear the words. So I will be calling on my board colleagues to lead the pledge, um, a different member at every meeting. So thank you for that, Member McCoy. Sorry, I was on mute. Thank you, Member McQueen. At this point, we are at letter A, adoption of the agenda, approval of the consent agenda. I'm looking for a motion. Madam President, uh, I would like, I move that we adopt the agenda and approve the consent agenda. Action item 20-05-55. I uh, second it. Thank you. Motion was made by Member Brooks and seconded by Member Lazarowitz. Ms. Merritt, would you like to walk us through the consent agenda, please? Yes, this evening, the consent agenda consists of human resources transactions since our last time together. We have the um, administrative replacement for the principal of Workman Elementary School for your consideration this evening. We also have leaves, resignations, and retirements, as well as the approval of minutes from the regular meeting on May the 12th, 2020. The final readings of policies 1422.01, drug-free workplace, policy 2628, state aid incentives, and policy 3122.01-4122.01, drug-free workplace. Thank you. Any discussion? Okay, all in favor? And we're gonna do a roll call vote. Please say aye or nay. Member Brooks, please do yes, the roll call. Yes, Member Berninski. Aye, yes. Member Brooks, yes. Member Kehoe? Yes. Member Lozarowitz? Yes. Member McCoyne? Yes. Member Savage? Yes. And Member Sadu? Yes. Motion passes 7-0. It is so nice to say that number. Thank you for everyone being here. Good evening, everyone. I am fortunate enough to have the pleasure to introduce you to Ms. Carmen Johnson who is being recommended for appointment as the principal at Workman Elementary School. Carmen comes to us with a bachelor's degree from Western Michigan University, a master's degree in teaching and learning from Nova Southeastern University, an educational specialist degree in educational leadership from Oakland University. Carmen has held um, various positions in our district as well as some other districts and here are the positions that have been part of her career. Elementary art teacher, visual arts specialist, behavior specialist, assistant principal, and currently since 2016 Carmen has served as the student support coordinator at Field Elementary School and currently at Workman Elementary School. So Carmen, welcome. Some things or some words you would like to share with us at this time. You're on mute, Carmen. I'm sorry. First of all, I just wanna thank you all um, for this opportunity to come before you at the board meeting. That's such an honor. And thank you for this, um, opportunity to Monica and the core team. Um, I am so excited to um, be able to serve the Workman families and community in this way. I love Workman School and I just can't wait to be a part of this incredible um, journey. Thank you so much. Thank you, welcome Carmen. I've heard amazing things about you and I see lots of comments um, from people congratulating you. So welcome aboard. And I wish we could shake your hand, but let's do a virtual shake. Actually, we can't, we can't do shaking anyway. So welcome aboard. Liz, I, I hope she's still getting the chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> I'm unable to hear what Patrick just shared. I'm sorry, it's no big deal. 
He asked if she was still going to get her chocolate bar. We will make sure she gets her chocolate. <laughs> okay, thank you. All right, we are now moving on to part B, the board committee reports and action items and starting with the president's report. Um, as uh, Ms. Merritt said, um, hope everyone had a safe Memorial Day weekend and uh, thank you to everyone that has served um, for this great country and for the time and the service that you have given uh, for people that have lost their lives for this wonderful country. So we are um, totally grateful for everyone that has been um, giving their lives and time for that. Um, at this point, um, I would also like to remind my board colleagues that to please reach out to Ms. Merritt on scheduling your one-on-one -on -one meetings as she has made herself available to each board member to meet individually. So if you have not scheduled that one-on-one -on -one meeting with Superintendent Merritt, please do so and make sure you CC me on that. And lastly, I want to thank the districts and the community members who have uh, been part of the re-entry task force. I've been hearing great things about that. It's a large team. It's, uh, it's a huge task. So I look forward to hearing more about the re-entry options for the fall. And I wanna thank everybody for their time and commitment to that important work. And uh, next up is student performance and achievement committee update. We have not met since our last meeting. And I uh, just wanted to remind everybody, we do have a meeting coming up on June 3rd. It'll be at 4.30 p.m. and we will be doing that virtually. Member McQueen, you are up next with the policy committee. Uh, thank you. So we actually met this evening at 5.30 uh, virtually before this meeting that we had here. Um, we are pretty much caught up on our policies. We have a few that will be brought to the board um, next month. And um, we were just cleaning up some language and some questions that we had. So our district council joined us and it was a pretty short meeting. And our next meeting will be June 23rd. Uh, that will also be virtual and it will be at 5.30 PM. So looking forward to seeing anybody who is interested in attending. Thank you. We are up next with Finance and Operations Committee update. Member Kiho. Thank you. We met uh, last Thursday, the 21st, and we had a review of the last month's uh, budget uh, process, where I'm sorry, the last month's financials and where we were against budget in that review. And then we also had a very difficult discussion on the, uh, the budget that we will carry forward into this evening's uh, uh, full board meeting. Um, it's, we're in difficult times right now and everybody is working together to make sure that we can properly support our students. And it was a, a productive, although difficult conversation last week. And I'm hoping for the same this evening. We'll have a next meeting coming up on Thursday, June 4th at 5 p.m. And we welcome the community's uh, review and participation in that as well. Thank you, Member Kiho. And um, I'm sorry, I, we have to go back and Liz froze, so I thought we were done, um, but she did not get an opportunity to talk about the leaves and re resignations. Liz, are you still there? Yes, thank you. Okay. Can you hear me fine? Yes. Okay, well, first of all, congratulations, Carmen, because I think I froze right at the end. We're very thankful that you will be in this new position. And I know Maureen Malloy is also joining us to celebrate this appointment, and I know that you two will work well together. So congratulations, Carmen. Yeah. Okay, next, I would like to congratulate some teachers that are retiring from our district. Sharon Caldwell, biology teacher at Salem High School. Congra congratulations, retiring after 25 years of service. Mary Covert Mason is a teacher at Dotson for students in the ASD program, retiring after 11 years of service. Dixie Peterson, retiring from elementary classroom at Isbister after 43 years of service. Mary Porter is an elementary teacher at Farron, retiring after 25 years of service. Lynette Weyer is a teacher at Liberty. She's retiring after 23 years of service. So congratulations to all of our teachers who are retiring and thank you for everything you have done for our students, staff and families. Thank you. 
Thank you. All right, we are now up to part C, citizens' comments. And let's take a look. Um, we did have that form shared with member McCoin and member Kehoe so we could split the reading. So you didn't have to listen to one person read through all the comments. So I'll take the first one while you two navigate the form and find the comments for the other ones. So I'll start the first one. This is from Dannon McGuire. And comment is listed as following. I understand the district is being asked to make significant budget cuts. In reviewing the cuts that you have made, I commend you for looking at all areas. I would urge you to reconsider the cuts at the middle school and high school of the web and link crew programs. During a time when our utmost concern should be student well being, these programs play an invaluable part in helping our children to transition from one learning level to the next. Moving to middle school and especially high school can be anxiety inducing for even the strongest willed child during the best of times. I can't begin to imagine how these children will feel as they head back to school next year. It is for these reasons and many more that I urge you to at least consider partially funding both the web program and link crew so that some sort of incoming orientation can take place for these students, even if it is done at a partially virtual level. Thank you for that comment, Donna, Dan and McGuire. And I will go to member McCoyne. Are you able to locate the next one? Yes, yes, okay. I did. Thank okay. you. Okay, uh, this one is from Seth Perlow. It says, thank you board members for ensuring that public comments are still readily available for our community. I am writing you this evening to express my deep concerns about the PCCS proposed budget and the looming deficit that is coming as a result of the COVID-19 crisis. While I'm sure I share these concerns with many, my goal tonight is to illuminate the fact that these proposed cuts are just the beginning and to urge the entire community to act in an effort to secure state and federal assistance specifically for our public schools if we don't want to see historic levels of harm done. The last funding cuts from the state that even closely resembled what we are all anticipating for the next school year was in 2011 when $470 was cut from the per pupil foundation allowance. Districts across the state have literally just gotten back to those funding levels nearly a decade later. The current projection of $650 per pupil cut that PCCS is using, which is in line with many districts in this area, will be so severe there just simply isn't any sort of precedent to follow to determine the impact this will have on our school community. The staff and students of this district suffered tremendously as a result of the 2011 cuts. A steady increase in class sizes, in class size, closure of schools, slow adaptation of up-to-date curriculum, and the ability to adequately clean our buildings are just a few of the direct results of these funding struggles. Also important to consider, cuts like these that have been seen across the nation have had a permanent impact on all professions related to public schools. There continues to be a massive teacher shortage and much of the data surrounding why point to the lack of respect and continued low wages. When salaries of teachers and support staff have been flat or declining, especially as a result of increased costs related to health care, it's no surprise we are seeing the result being a mass exodus from the profession. And let's not forget the quality of the profession and the professionals who are attracted to it have a direct impact on the quality of the education our students receive. We must demand more for our educators and students alike. So what will these cuts do beyond just this year? To be honest, I don't even want to think about it. However, it is without question that every student in the district will be negatively impacted by these cuts. A one-year hiatus for web and link crew will pale in comparison to the future 
proposed cuts the district will have to consider. What we need to prevent this is simple financial relief from the state and federal governments. While any anger directed at the district or board of education here may be well-intentioned, it is simply misguided. I am urging all community members to reach out to their state and federal representatives and to demand that schools do not once again be the sole provider for economic relief during a financial crisis. Representatives Christy Pagan, Matt Colazar, and Senator Dana Paul Hankey represent our community directly in the state legislature. Senator Mike Shirky and Representative Lee Chatfield are the legislative leaders in Michigan who could advance any sort of funding relief through the state legislative process. Representative Haley Stevens and Senators Debbie Stabenow and Gary Peters are our direct federal legislators in Michigan. Please contact each of these representatives to demand financial relief for our public schools. These are dire circumstances we are about to find ourselves in and will require wholesale community action to prevent the worst from happening. Our next comment is from uh, Rochelle Besco. Rochelle writes, in a video promoting the bond proposal, our superintendent says that the bond is necessary to create the environment our students deserve. Well, I believe student environment goes beyond just the physical attributes of the facilities and also includes the social environment for the students. Cutting WEB goes against the principle of Plymouth Canton Schools is committed to creating the environments our students deserve. I'm writing to strongly urge the board to require the district to reconsider the choice to cut WEB. This program is more important now than ever. The fifth graders did not have any closure from elementary or any of the traditional acclimation to middle school. As a mother of a fifth grader, I can tell you they are feeling very anxious about the transition to middle school. WEB is a well-known program designed to have eighth grade student leaders help sixth graders throughout the year, including at the beginning of the year. WEB leaders are, represent, are a representation of model behavior in middle school. They are committed to stopping any bullying they see against sixth graders, and they are intended to uh, and they are intended to be a safe space for sixth graders to go to when the transition to middle school seems overwhelming, scary, or confusing. Maybe it is difficult to understand, but I, believe, but I believe if you ask the sixth grade teachers, they will tell you how important this is for 11-year-olds who are facing the transition to middle school in uncertain times. I know because one of those 11-year-olds is my daughter, who is deeply disappointed that she may not have an eighth grade mentor. The district may rather be... The district, the district should rather be creative with how this program is funded. Student athletes pay to play. Why didn't the school consider asking WB leaders to pay a small fee to be part of the program? The district could also be cons consider other ways to fund the program, such as grants or donations. Who made this decision? I would like a public answer to that. I cannot imagine those that made this decision understand the sixth grade experience like the teachers in the classroom. Were the sixth grade teachers or the WB leaders included in the decision? It seems like a quick, easy choice. As a teacher who understands the strength of student-led programs like this to build safe, positive environments in our schools, I'm deeply disappointed in this cut. An indication of the hastiness of this decision can be found in the fact that the WB student leaders across the district have applied, created application videos, and have had a test video conference for training that is to begin this week. Now, rather than creatively finding a way to make the program work, the district is ready to tell eighth grade WB leaders the district is cutting the program the WB leaders believe in, a program that bridges the intimidating gap between sixth graders and eighth graders, a program that they've already been accepted into. The adults must do better to protect the important programs like WB. Thank you. There, I believe there's one more, um, so I'll take that one. This is from Kelly Harrison. Uh, these are actually questions um, starting with, does the district plan to adhere to the end of the 2019-20 school year dates as previously outlined. Have there been any discussions of an alternative date for starting the 2021 school year? And that is the end of Kelly Harrison's citizens comment. And Nick, do we have any more? We do not. That was the end of it, there was just four. Okay. Thank you. And I appreciate all the citizens that have continued to participate in our meetings. All right, we are um, up to letter D, administrative reports and recommendations, starting with the superintendent's report. Thank you. Um, 
although we, we will be talking about the budget a little later, I just want to make sure that I address an earlier comment um, and tried to share this information through email uh, today. Um, all of these cuts are not easy cuts and I never want anyone to believe that any decision was short-sighted or not well discussed and, and thought out. Um, the question around even our web program and our young uh, students being trained we all were uh, blindsided, I will say that, from the projections that came out of the Michigan Estimating Revenue Conference on May 15th. So up until this point, we were initially planning for a 350 student reduction that then changed to a 500 student reduction. On May 15th, we then learned that the reduction could be anywhere between $600 and $2,000 per student. And so we had to go to work uh, making some decisions with the principles, really two guiding principles. One, to try to maintain our class size, and two, to try to keep as many people in our district employed as possible, because we do believe that stability is important for our school district during this time of the pandemic. So with that being said, I know that people um, have seen this uh, preliminary projection or of recommendations, and we'll discuss those in more detail. Some of the items here, uh, we are currently looking for creative ways to provide this service differently. So all of these suggestions aren't just based on budget. When you look at web and link, we truly believe in the importance of this peer program. But at this time, we would not be able to bring 1300 kids to the park. Even if we look at transportation, Right now, the guideline for CDC is 12 students per bus. So this would actually be a greater cost with transportation. So we are talking about ways that we could still, when we are able, safely provide a different type of service. If that could come at the form of some uh, pay to play, if that could come at the form of virtual, whatever they that might be. So I just want people to know at this point, we are very thoughtful in the recommendations that have come forward. They are all difficult cuts. If because so many things are still uncertain, we are not looking at a $650 student cut. They're gonna prior prioritize some things that come back. But as I said, some things are not just based on budget, but also based on where we are in terms of safety guidelines. And so we will be diligent to make sure that we are looking for ways to continue to provide services and programs from, for students for the 2021 school year, even if they may look differently. So I'll talk a little bit more later about that, but I just wanted to address that. I know that people want answers today and we don't have the answers, but I will assure you that every person involved in this budget process, we talked about so many um, different recommendations, but we will continue to be creative in anything that has to remain as a final reduction that we find ways to make sure that we're providing services for all of our students because we know how important that is. So with that being said, I want to shift to a mode of celebration and appreciation. Today, we had an opportunity to begin our senior uh, send-off. It began today with our Canton students, and I know that that has also been a topic for uh, many weeks where uh, parents wanted to know what was going on, and so we just appreciate the patience. We assured you that we would not leave our seniors behind. So they had an opportunity today to have an amazing senior send-off. Had to be a drive-through type of scenario. I'm not going to give away any spoilers because tomorrow Plymouth students will have that opportunity and on Thursday Salem students will have that opportunity with a makeup day I think at the end of the week. So really taking chances to celebrate and celebrate differently these milestones for our seniors because we know for any of our students unfortunately the pandemic has stolen so much um, but we will creatively continue to find ways to celebrate our students and, and help them to be acknowledged and honored for the work that they do. Um, also, just want to give a quick update for our bond sale. The bonds are going for sale this Thursday. We want to thank you again to our community for passing our 2020 bond. On this Thursday, May 28th, we are selling 98.38 million in municipal bonds. The competitive sales for bonds have rebounded as of late and based on recent sales in the area, along with our excellent AA2 excellent Moody's credit rating, we feel like the bond marketplace for us is in good shape right now. So we will see that notification in the paper tomorrow. Just wanted to update you on that. Um, wanted to talk a little bit more. I think uh, President Sadu had talked about the re-entry task force. We had um, an overwhelming amount of interest 
um, for, from our community to be stakeholders um, and participants in our task force. We appreciate all of the interest from our parents and community members. We have developed at this point 15 subcommittees covering various aspects of the district. They're working to develop plans really at this point. Their charge is around three scenarios, returning to school, full face-to-face -face instruction in the fall, looking at the potential of a online remote learning environment, and a third option is a hybrid of both models. So really looking um, at a lot of information and details or, and planning around that. At the same time, our county leaders and state leaders are planning for guidelines that will be delivered. So we're making sure that our plans are fluid so that we can adapt to the guidelines that come down from the state. Although our committees have been chosen, there will be some opportunities for those that are still interested to participate and some focus group leaders, groups later. It is really important that we hear all voices as we move forward to make plans for um, what we hope to be a safe uh, re-entry to face-to-face. -to -face. Of course, instruction is our number one goal, but we will figure out how, um, what option will work best based, from the, based on the guidelines from the state. Um, finally, in terms of our home learning plan, I want to thank families that took the time uh, over the past couple of weeks to respond to our recent survey on our home learning plan. The feedback is so important to us. And for those that sometimes are, they don't wanna invest in taking the time to do surveys because they don't think that people have the time to listen, we listen, we pay attention because for us, we are always on a path to continuous improvement. And we want to make sure that we meet the very needs of all of our students. And throughout this process, it has been um, incredibly difficult because we have so many needs. So we hear from parents that say that this is too much or there's too many um, emails and too many communications to the other uh, groups of parents who believe that um, we're not doing enough. And I understand that. So looking at the feedback, I will say we've had from the parent group, I think over 6,000 uh, people responded to the survey. If you think in uh, general of our K-12 survey, we usually get about 4,000 participants. So we know that people were really invested in giving us this feedback. A message that came across was consistency of the program delivery during this time. And so we're really working to adjust for and finish the year strong. Um, the biggest piece is really wanting uh, students to be able, if they choose, to have live interactions with their teachers. And that is happening all across the district. But we wanted to make sure that we can provide that opportunity for all students. So as we finalize the last few weeks of school, the expectation will be that our teachers will work to make live touch points, at least three, between now and the school year. And information will come um, from, from teachers to their students. So we think that this could be an incredible opportunity for not only all students to see each other and engage in um, just maybe something as basic as, as sharing what's going on in their day to seeing um, their classmates as well. And so I'm excited about that. Um, and I look forward to, to finishing the year strong. I just want to publicly again say, and I can't say enough, um, my appreciation and gratitude for our teachers. And I know anything that we can do, we will never satisfy everyone, but I tell you that to their core, they have worked diligently in trying to meet the needs of all of our students and they don't complain. And so many of them are dealing with the impacts of COVID-19. We've, you know, people personally within their families and still they show up for our students. So I just, um, we realize that this program can be better, but I also just want to applaud the people that are making it happen and, and providing opportunities for our students every day. And that's our teachers. And I want to thank them. I want to thank our administrators as well, because when you look at a district our size and managing expectations and a lot then goes um, on our principals to help navigate and interpret. And it's not easy, uh, but everybody is here and dedicated to doing what's best for, for students. So when we think about our task force, that is a, a big job right now to say this has been emergency learning. We haven't said this is true distance learning. Kids went home on March 16th and we did not know that they were not returning. So our teachers had to step in and provide remote learning experiences without much training, but they, they stood up for, for that challenge. Now, as we are planning for the fall, we know that that program will have to be a true distance learning program in the event that we have to go to a remote learning environment. And so I am very, very pleased with the work that is coming out of the committee already. Um, just the feedback, the ideas, the planning, so thoughtful. 
we will continue to post updates from the task force in, uh, in, ter in terms of being transparent minutes from the meetings, those can be found on the website. And so I just wanna encourage everyone in the community uh, to stay involved and, and look for future opportunities for feedback. So as I always try to remain optimistic, this is tough. We are going through some challenges right now, but I am so proud of our staff and I continue to be optimistic because I believe that we will weather this storm, the financial, the challenges of the pandemic, and we will come out on the other strong side even stronger than we are to today. So just appreciate everyone and uh, look forward to continuing to work through this together. Member Kehoe. Yeah, so I, I just wanted to have two, two comments. One is, is uh, Ms. Merritt spoke about the bond, and I wanna make sure that I explain to our audience and the community that there's a difference between the bond, which can be used for capital projects like school improvements and bus purchases and technology purchases, and the subject that we're gonna have later this evening, which is our operating funds budget. We're not allowed to use any of those bond money to support those operating funds gaps that we may, that we're expecting from the state um, it does help us to make sure that we can not have to use our operating funds to, to um, do those capital improvements. And we really appreciate the community's support for that bond, but we can't use those funds for one thing or the other. The other thing I wanted to mention is, is there was a fifth citizen's comment that came in uh, just uh, as we were shutting it down. It was from Kelly Harrison. And Kelly said, or Kelly's question was, what is the district's timeline and plan for introducing the 5G platform into the various buildings? Thank you for catching that. Um, I noticed that and so I'm glad um, you caught it and read it. So we wanna make sure that our, we honor the citizens who actually typed in during that time frame. And so thank you for having that read out loud. Okay, we are now um, on to part two of administrative reports and recommendations with a finance and operations presentation. <coughs> Thank you. I am Debbie Piaz. I'll go, go over the budget overview with assumptions um, as updated from our last meeting. Um, so we'll go over swiftly the things that we covered two weeks ago and we'll slow down on the areas that are new um, and um, as a result of all the meetings and all the the virtual uh, workshops we've done today. So we wanted to start with a financial update for you. Um, look at the audit um, results of the year ended June 30th, 2019 from our independent auditors. Look briefly at our current situation. The year we're in is June 30, 2020. And then look at the outlook um, for the future year, June 30th, 21. We'll look at the, the impact of COVID-19 and what's happened uh, to date and then look at our initial budget uh, suggestions, um, our long-term outlook and some of the budget processes we've gone through to date. Now the budget uh, or the financial information from the year ended June 30th, 2019 was audited by our independent auditors, Plant and Moran, and they found our general fund uh, balance at $37.8 million or about 22.5% of total general fund expenditures. As you know, board policy is 10%, and the recommendation from the auditors at that time was to maintain about a 15% fund equity. The current year that we're in was amended on February the 11th, and on February the 11th, we projected a fund equity of about $35.5 million, or a small use of about $2.3 million in fund equity, um, or in remaining with 19.8% uh, all year over year uh, of the general fund expenditures. We were looking towards a final amendment in June and had our enhancement uh, dollars uh, collected. We're in year five of a six year millage. And then COVID-19 occurred. And so we had to end face-to-face -face instruction and move to a virtual environment. As you know, the citizens uh, or the um, consensus revenue estimating conference, CREC is what it's known as, is a consensus uh, a meeting of the governor's office, the Senate, and the House. And that happens twice annually, usually in January and usually in May. It happened in January. We were going along quite well. 
We were meeting our expectations and our um, anticipated um, milestones as we were marching towards this year. But with the impact of COVID-19, it significantly impacted the school aid fund, which is used to fund all public schools and private schools now in the state of Michigan. Unfortunately, so much has happened that the May Re uh, Consensus Revenue Estimating Conference didn't really reflect the entire, uh, I'll call it shutdown period. It only reflected the last two weeks of March. And so now what has been uh, proposed is potentially another meeting in August. Um, part of the reason is, unfortunately, we are a June 30th year end, fiscal year end, as in are all public schools. And we're required by the Uniform Budgeting Act to adopt a budget prior to the end of our current fiscal year. The state's year end is 9.30, September 30th. And so they have three extra months for which to determine where their revenue streams are in, inward and outbound. And so that causes us a little angst because there's a lot of unknowns right now, a lot of gray, a lot of estimation that has had to occur that is normally known by this point in the fiscal year. So here's a graph that was first presented earlier this year um, by the House Fiscal Agency. Um, and this was an estimate of what it was gonna look like for 2021, I'll say pre-COVID. Um, and so the school aid fund, which funds the foundation allowance um, is limited by law, is primarily funded from sales tax on retail sales. And because we have not had retail sales in approximately 10 weeks, that number is substantially lower than um, it was estimated to be. The second number, which is significant, is the individual income tax. And the individual income tax was also delayed. So it's usually due on April the 15th, tax day, and it was pushed back till July the 15th. So because it was pushed back three months, now the state will have three months um, push of their uh, revenue stream. And so that will impact um, the revenue sources which fund the school aid fund significantly. And you can see all the other pieces uh, pale in comparison to those two, which make up about 46% of the total. The process we had um, on the onset was good. We had assumptions, we had a calendar, we were moving along um, until COVID um, changed those assumptions. Um, the superintendent and core have reviewed a series of scenarios and brainstorming activities. The leadership team has met, usually only meets twice, has met five times to date. We'll meet a sixth time tomorrow to discuss several rounds of budgeting, budget cuts, budget transformation prom, uh, process, and push forward some of the um, cuts and reductions that we'll see tonight. In addition, the Board of Education Finance and Operations meeting has meet, met twice on this topic, both on the 7th and on the 21st for updates and feedback into the, pro, into the process. So I just want to remind everyone the revenue esti uh, estimations that we've done, as um, Superintendent Merritt mentioned earlier, we, we started at $300, $350 per full-time equivalent student we then moved to 500 and then we quickly moved to 650. That's kind of where the rest of the state is going as well. I'm keeping in touch with my statewide associations as well as the superintendent. Um, and that's where uh, the majority of Michigan schools are landing at this particular moment in time. We also looked at budget projections that were done both back when we did the um, facility um, needs study as well as uh, Sanford, who does our uh, enrollment projections on an annual basis, and we think we'll see a, a small reduction in our uh, pu per pupil, about 150 uh, full-time equivalent students um, to a, a total of about 17,228. We held the grants static, and then obviously, as I said earlier, the enhancement millage is in year five of a six-year millage.
the expenditures to date, the, you know, the largest, uh, we're a service industry. So our largest is salary and benefits of our staff. Um, the MIPSERS retirement rate is the Michigan Public School Employee Retirement System. We're mandated to, se to send uh, 27, 28 uh, cents on the dollar up to the Office of Retirement Services in order to fund retirement. Hard cap is our hard cap on our health insurance. We're self-funded and we can only pay um, a capped rate and that is increased by 2% only for year over year. Uh, we held some other um, uh, uh, expenditures constant um, and they were included in the initial estimates of expenditures. So if you look at all the revenue and you look at all the expenditures, where we were at 650 per full-time equivalent student with all those expenditures is approximately $19 million deficit for the year. Um, that's a, leaving us a fund equity of about 8.7%. And still, we don't know what the school aid will be for 2021. That's going to be probably outstanding till probably August or September at this point. So what do we do about that? We did some brainstorming and included a lot of these um, in our conversations for the last several months. We looked at freezing staff, um, hiring, using only attrition and retirement when we can. Um, we looked at uh, matching our current staff assignments to our current enrollment numbers, um, looking at uh, efficiencies in our program delivery or the ways we deliver certain programs looked at establishing the Virtual Learning Academy. We looked at block grant amounts. Those are the amounts to individual buildings, as well as the capital outlay spending account that every single building has. We looked at deferring some textbook purchases for one year. We looked at expanding the schools of choice admission process and opening up a secondary window to, to garner um, some of those schools of choice students. We did not get in the initial window the number of registrations um, that we usually get. And so hopefully by expanding this window, we'll be able to capture uh, more uh, full-time equivalent students. We looked at freezing travel, conferences, a professional development, maximizing our grant funds. So if we have a grant, make sure that the, all the grant requirements are met and some of those expenses in the general fund maybe can be offset by those grant expenditures. Um, looking at the savings because we don't have face-to-face -face instruction right now. And so there's certain supplies, uh, materials, and other purchases that have been um, basically suspended at this time and looked at and reductions from all central office departments. So first of all, we developed a plan of action. And this plan of action was twofold. The plan of action said, well, let's try and look for reductions. There are at least half of this $19 million number. Let's look at that. And then the other half would come from fund equity. Um, obviously, we'd have to make those cuts um, on a going forward basis. But for right now, we could get that far. And the other thing we tried to do was maintain the fund equity at about 15% at the end of the day. So we looked again to maintain current staffing when we could and avoid as many layoffs as possible. We looked at attrition and retirement, and that would mean a certification process for, for certain staff that need cert certifications. We'd look at um, general fund um, uh, usage in the, in the future, only in the flexibility standpoint and, and allowing us the time in order to react to things that come down the pike for us. If this is not a one-time uh, one year problem, and then looked at all the other um, restricted funds to make sure that they were maximized for their usage. So then this is what we came up with as a group. Um, the actionable items included in here are um, a savings from uh, June 30th, 2020 due to the lack of face-to-face -face instruction. We've always had a budget to actual difference at the end of the year, and it hasn't been smaller than $3.2 million in any one of the last three years. So again, we've tightened our budgeting, but we think that we'll have a savings of that magnitude. 
We looked at deferring um, some of our textbook purchases for next year for one more year. Um, looked at opening the schools of choice admissions window and then looked at really look at enrollment and the number of students in a classroom and then looked at what the staffing would be as assigned to those that, that based on enrollment. And we were able to uh, reduce uh, about 15.8 full-time equivalent um, staff at a cost of about a million six. And then uh, the other bogey was the Federal CARES Act. That's been allocated to us. Um, the full allocation is $797,150, but it is subject to the title um, allocation structure, which means we have to share that um, proportionally with our um, private schools in the Birmingham Public Schools. So the net amount that we would receive is about $714,000. Those all total $7.3 million in cuts. De Debbie, Plymouth, Pl Plymouth Canton Public Schools. You said Birmingham. Oh, sorry. Oh my gosh, sorry. Two years, I still can't remember. Okay. Our department actionable items um, the superintendent and the Board of Education. Um, the superintendent, uh, Board of Education is talking about um, reducing their meeting stipends. And in the superintendent's area, they're talking about contracted service reductions um, for uh, contracts, vendors, legal, that kind of thing. Teaching and Learning has looked at their department and looked at a deferral of the math consumables, a shift of the early literacy instructional coach to a Wayne Risa grant, a suspension of some professional development, an instructional or coach returning to the classroom, leaving the position vacant for one year, and then an interventionalist reduction due to a retirement. The Human Resources Department then looked at reductions in the days of the premier substitute teacher program starting then in October versus in September and gaining about 17 days reductions in professional development and in supplies. The Student Services Department talked about reductions in professional development as well and contracted services, supplies, materials, and other as well. Um, communications and marketing looked at removing an investment for an EMS system upgrade, which is our invent management software system, um, reviewing, uh, removing stipends for the webmaster work, and taking that in-house, uh, deferring contracted services for the K-12 Insight Survey, so um, and then a reduction in the events and promotional expenses categories. The safety and security um, looked at uh, eliminating the Social Sentinel program and the deferring a vacancy in the Security Assessment Center Coordinator for one year. The uh, Nutritional Services Program had a few folks that were split between the General Fund and the Nutritional Services Fund, and they're moving um, two of those, or 1.0 FTE, two half times, into um, the Food Service Fund and away from the General Fund. The Maintenance and Operations um, Department looked at um, reductions in the grounds and work order supplies, looked at deferring a vehicle and an equipment and replacement purchase, looked at eliminating one grounds position due to a retirement, and then looked at utility savings for gas, electric, and water, and sewer. And the finance department then looked at reducing uh, some temporary accounting services they had had in their budget that they're no longer using. Special education looked at um, the reduction of uh, special ed teachers through attrition or retirements three FTE and eliminating some vacant peer professional positions. All in all looking at caseloads, maintaining caseloads and maintaining all that's legal under the IEP process. So that doesn't affect that. Um, and then looking at reductions in supplies uh, as well as delaying filling a vacancy for an elementary teacher consultant. The integrated technology department looked at reducing repairs and maintenance, voice data and telephone costs. Uh, looked at reducing some summer temporary staffing they had had, and then reductions in the equipment rental and other areas. The elementary school principals um, with their level leader 
all came um, in, in, together as a group and um, put forward these suggestions. So to the eliminate the world language for one year, that's the fifth grade uh, experience for Spanish at one FTE, eliminating $2,000 per building assessment stipend, reduction of the time of some time for a technology and media peer professional, just um, one hour across all buildings, uh, defer capital outlay purchases, defer paper consumption, teacher supplies, and then um, the kindergarten orientation, doing that a little bit differently. Um, suspending the concert for kids and the gear school field trips for one year. That was probably part of the safety that we looked at and that probably couldn't put that many kids on a bus in an area to do that activity. And then obviously the printing cost as well. So all in all, this elementary school principals came up with $386,000 in cuts. Same with middle school and their level leaders. They all came together as a group and looked at deferring capital outlay purchases, suspending the current uh, participation in the religious diversity journey program for one year, postpone the replacement of some athletic uniforms, reduce black grant, paper consumption, print costs, look at um, reducing some staffing again, according to formula. So this is an addition to the one mentioned earlier, 1.6 FTEs, and then suspend the web program. Their total is $225,100. Finally, the high schools got together with their level leader and they talked about, again, reductions of the capital uh, outlay purchases, reductions in the block grant allocation for this next year, reduction in the IB budget for workshops, conferences, and supplies. And I know there was a question on that and they still maintain their compliance with the requirements for the IB curriculum. So that doesn't interfere with that. The suspension of the challenge day and link crew for one year and the reduction in graduation and honors program for one year, doing it in a virtual setting or another setting. Um, this was some savings um, even above and beyond that um, for the EMU program and others. We, we were continuing to look at reductions in uh, the number of people necessary at graduation um, because EMU provided their own security force and their own cleaning uh, uh, staff. Reductions in the SRO overtime, reductions in athletic improvements, coaches, workshops, clinics, supplies, looking at shifting a CTE coordinator to the CTE budget, and then suspending the purchase of some library uh, media center books for one year and reducing some staff development across all buildings. Last page of the high school principals list was the STEM um, Academy reductions for again, workshops, conferences, teaching supplies, capital improvement budgets, teaching supplies, art academy, uh, workshops and conferences, again, paper allocation, testing supplies and printing costs, art and music department reductions. And then finally the Starkweather Academy had some reductions in purchase services, teaching supplies, copy paper, office supplies, that kind of thing. And their, that high school total was $352,000. So all in all, we had a deficit of 16.7. Our total actionable items, as mentioned above, was just under $10 million at 9.957. Um, and leaving us with a um, remaining deficit to tackle of $6.7 million. It leaves us at fund equity at about 15%. Um, all in all at this point. Our next steps will be to um, verify these priorities with the leadership team tomorrow, um, go through and make sure we uh, have all our uh, recommended cuts, uh, create a final budget document, which we will present to FNO, which is the Finance and Operations Subcommittee meeting on June the 4th, and then bring to the Board of Education during the public hearing on June 9th, um, the a total amount of budget and suggested reductions for a resolution on June 23rd. Before moving into questions, uh, Debbie, I just wanna add uh, just a few thoughts. I just wanna be clear, even in the language behind uh, the recommendations, you will see the word suspend 
versus eliminate. We're looking at one year at a time right now. And what I will say, and I've said, uh, can, we've worked really hard over the last few years to build a healthy fund balance for times when it's raining and it's definitely raining. So there's so much uncertainty right now, even with our state projections, we would normally have our projections right now for you to approve this budget by June 30th. We probably will not have clear numbers until August or possibly even September. With that in mind, we think about what we as a school district represent for our community and that is stability. And so, as I said in the front end, we really want it to come to these uh, recommended reductions, looking at the conservative approach of trying to meet half of the reductions uh, and using a plan use of fund balance for the other half, but also looking through the, the lens of those two principles, maintaining class size when possible. We are really moving towards when we are able to return to face-to-face -face instruction and following social distance guidelines with even one more student in a classroom will make that even more difficult. So we wanted to be able to maintain that. And also in terms of the programs that we provide, our people are so important. And so at this point, using the $650 figure, we wanted to make sure that we followed those two principles so we can still keep um, honoring our mission and vision and providing a strong educational program for our students. Once again, these are projections. And so things are changing so rapidly when we come back together, um, even in the fall, we will probably more than likely have to adjust. So we're going through a process of prioritizing, say, if the number is not as great, how do we bring some of these recommendations back? Of course, um, anything that's impacting um, students, that's a priority to get those back. But at the same time, I want to emphasize suspending doesn't mean at times suspending a, a program in its entirety. It's meaning that we look creatively how we can accomplish the same program differently at less cost. And so um, I just want to thank our uh, district and building leadership team. Um, and once again, I want to emphasize there are no easy reductions in our program. Every reduction impacts kids. We have worked hard to build a strong reputation here in our district and we are really committed to making sure that we remain stable for our students, for our employees, and for our community uh, during this time as we, we figure out more details. And so we wanna open up the floor for questions about um, these uh, preliminary reductions that are being recommended. Okay, I see Member Kehoe's hand. Go ahead, Member yeah, Kehoe. Sure. Thank you. So I just wanted to uh, bring up a point that we talked about in the FNO committee. And that is that there is a lot of uncertainty on this particular process right now. And whether $650 is going to be too much, whether that's going to be not enough. And from the discussions that we've had with the administration, they've, they've looked at all the cuts that they've done and they've ranked and prioritized those things, as well as they have the potential opportunity for additional things that we might consider if this was to be more than $650. So we are hoping that this is less than $650. And if that's the case, or we find that our budget surplus from this year is greater than we, uh, that, that, than we expected, then we'll be able to restore those programs in order of priority. So this is, this is what we have to do in order to create a balanced budget going into our, the end of our, our, our fiscal year at the end of June and what's required as part of the process uh, going forward. We have to pass that budget amendment, but there absolutely will be adjustments and changes. So that was the, uh, the overall comment that I wanted to make. And then I'll have questions, but I have others that I want to let talk first. No, thank you for mentioning that. Um, and that was a great discussion in FNO as well. So other members, questions, comments? Member McCoy? Uh, yes, thank you. Um, so down here in um, teaching and learning, when they're talking about um, an instructional coach returning to the classroom, an interventionist re reduction due to retirement. Um, I'm wondering about, um, like in the fall when kids go back, there's gonna be a lot of gaps. And I'm wondering if this is the time to be trying to, um, I feel like the teachers might need more help and not less, especially if they have to um, teach in the fall in some kind of a blended model 
where you're having maybe um, some face-to-face -face and some online. I'm, I'm wondering, do we have enough capacity to make sure everybody gets that training and all the supports they're gonna need? Um, considering the various levels of kids that are gonna show back up in a classroom, whether virtual or face-to-face -face in the fall? So I will say, great question. To address that, um, the program, uh, we, we've, we've only had, uh, we've grown our instructional coaches over the years, and this has been such a valuable position. I would say a district our size, we don't currently have enough instructional coaches to truly meet the needs of all of our teachers. So that was considered. Um, we were looking at that against other uh, cuts. Um, for example, there was something around technology. So we thought um, it's at this point, it's better to have that uh, technology person still um, replaced and, and being able to be in the event that we have more training that is needed in a remote space. So once again, looking for one year, the idea was to make sure that when possible, we keep everyone employed. So that still allows that person to shift into a classroom and the, uh, we wouldn't fill positions according to layoff. We would just uh, do some placements. Um, and then is when we look at the, uh, the literacy coach, that was a retirement of 0.6. And so um, having some discussions around how do we continue to meet the needs of our students with the current, um, I think we have an additional 23 uh, interventionist. And so really getting creative, how uh, looking at ways to continue to meet the needs of our teachers and our students, regardless of the way that we're coming back. And we believe, you know, once again, I will say all of these cuts are difficult, but when we looked at um, the, you know, at every single department, every level, uh, this is where we collectively agreed that we can um, move forward with different people taking on different responsibilities to get us through this year. Hopeful, of course, that the instructional coach was, that's right by the line. So in the event that we don't have to cut as much, that would be one of the first recommendations of things to come back is in, in terms of positions. And so we, we've taken a lot of thought and conversation through our trade-off program to say none of them are easy cuts, but what could we manage and maintain our program for one year? And, and that's the lens that we're looking through. Member McQueen, did you have any other questions, comments? Um, I was wondering um, how much, was there a savings that we realized with not having to administer um, many of the standardized tests at the end of the year, because this would be normally um, starting in May, you know, April, May testing season. Was there a savings in that? Um, some of the savings that would be um, substitutes for classrooms or that kind of thing, and that's included in that um, district wide total of 3.2. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm good for right now. Other members? Member Berninski. Hi, um, thank you for the presentation. So on the, um, I think it was the departmental um, actionable items under safety and security, I'm wondering um, about the Security Assessment Center coordinator. I understand that's vacant, but what does that position do? What Under the Michigan um, State Police grant that we received as a district, um, one of the things you'll have is a Security Assessment Center with a monitoring of the barriers that you're putting up at the park, um, as well as a series of cameras. Um, that we install with the um, secure entryway project. And so you, you'll be able to view those from this, it, it, it's really a converted classroom, but, um, and that those duties will then fall to members within the security staff that are currently at here um, and um, part of our uh, staffing. Okay, so there wouldn't be any issue um, with the grant because we don't have the staff. Right. The, the, the is grant all. was only meant to, to build or for capital outlay type items. So by the 
uh, monitors and to install the barriers. This as a part of the grant, we had the same number of security staff and we had worked to uh, reestablish some assignments so that this was more of a dedicated for that area. Same number of staff, different responsibilities. And so looking at this, we would re return back to the model where that is something that is rotated. The coverage will st would still be there um, with our current staff. And we're confident that we can move forward safely in that manner and that will not impact the grant that we received. Okay. Um, and then I noticed also um, going back to the expenditures, I think it was. Um, yeah, the, the page title, the expenditures. I think it's page 33, Nick. Um, and I noticed that we have an increase in the custodial and transportation contracts. And what I'm wondering is, I, are these increases in in their current contracts or um, what's accounting for the increase? Yep. So we have a current contract with them that's multiple years and they had like a CPI uh, increase of about 2% okay. per year in their contracts. Obviously with what's been going on, uh, we're receiving actually currently a credit in our monthly custodial bill because they don't, they're not staffing us to the full extent in there. So they're actually looking at actual payroll and uh, giving us a credit on a monthly basis. Transportation, um, we've been um, in talks with them to see what it looks like for fall. Um, if we're all virtual, obviously we won't need a transportation company, um, but if we're half virtual, half not, Kelly Spalding is our uh, manager of transportation and she has her own subcommittee as far, part of the task force and what it looks like in the fall. So, um, the that in that baseline budget was there two percent increases, which will obviously be all um, changed depending upon what the final um, school looks like in the fall decision. Debbie, okay. because we've seen CPI go, or I'm sorry, because of the current economic conditions, I would expect that CPI is going to go down. Yeah. Um, what did we budget for that? It's in their current contract because it's a multiple year contract. It's 1.99, I think, for transportation and two for custodial. So it's not a CPI then. It is a built in escalator. It's not based. It is on, a built in, yes. So it's not based upon CPI then. It, it was when it was originally, I guess. Uh, okay, so it's negotiated based upon an average of what you have, but it's built in. It's not based upon a specific. It's not percentage. floating, yes. Yeah, got it. Okay, thank you. Right. So with that, um, have we talked to them about um, the possibility of renegotiating on that? We will as soon as we decide what we're doing for fall. Okay. So you know, I, I have to decide whether or not I have a full complement of students or not, uh, whether or not we're going 100% virtual or not, but they're both on subcommittees for uh, return to school task forces. Okay, thank you. Other board members, questions, comments? Okay, member Kehoe, back to you. Yeah, if nobody else has them then. Uh, so I had two questions. Um, one is I noticed the printing costs. We applied the same rate for printing cost reductions to smaller schools like elementary as we did to larger schools like middle schools and high school. Shouldn't we be able to eke out a, a higher percentage at the high school level um, from a printing cost perspective? Um, we could, uh, we could look at that um, on a going forward basis. Uh, those groups came up with their um, black grant reductions for printing costs, but we could certainly look at that. Yeah, I mean, just on a per pupil basis, it's when you have 500 students and you're taking $1,000 off versus $2,000, you're taking, you know, um, much less uh, uh, off. So instead of $2, you're taking 50 cents. And it was expected actually even the printing cost at the high school level would generally, I, actually, I don't know whether it is generally less or, or, or more. So, but I guess it's something that worthwhile to, to see whether um, that is something that could be absorbed based upon the school size. Sure. Okay. And then the second question I have was really about some of these, these programs that we're suspending, um, whether it be the, the WEB or the link crew or the other things that we're doing. And Monica, you spoke about this in your superintendent's report. 
Can you share with the board and the community how we can still keep these programs without having a traditional process? I think we've concerned members of the community that we're not gonna do the programs. And I think that the message is, from what I understood, is that we're gonna do the programs, we're just not gonna do them in the same way. And so what I would say is too prelim it's too early to say which programs that we're committed to doing differently because we just don't know what guidelines we have to follow. So all of the reductions that impact students, we're taking the time to see how we could address that differently. So for example, if you're looking at a web type program, if we're not able to return 1500 students to a campus, is that something that we can do virtual tours? Is that something that we can do small groups over time? Is it something that we could eliminate the transportation costs because it would actually be, you know, if we have 80 kids on a bus right now, and we're only allowed to put 12, that would be additional costs associated. Could we cut the cost of transportation and have parents bring their students? So not just with the web program, but every program looking at creative ways that we could still make sure that um, the peer mentorship happens for our students and that we are preparing them to, to make those transitions in a safe in, in a safe way. I don't want to come out and say, you know, we are we're going to guarantee this because I don't even know when it shakes out, will that be a, a program that is actually cut? Those there's so much uncertainty. So really the charge of our team is to look at all of these services and programs that um, are being recommended for suspension for a year and see how we can provide that same service as, if possible safely, um, maybe differently in the fall. Okay, so obviously kids are going through a lot of transitions right now, and it's been very painful for them and, and finding ways to serve them, even if we serve them differently is really going to be key. And I think when we go to the the, the first read of the budget process that we'll do in our next board meeting as part of our public hearing, I think it would be useful to have some context around that we're going to serve these to students' needs. We'll do, and so we're going to commit to the, the premise of the program, even if we end up executing it differently. Because otherwise, okay. And, and you look, for example, um, the concert for kids. And so we probably wouldn't be in a space where we could bring every single fourth grader to Salem's auditorium, but is there a way that we could do something virtually? So they're staying home in their classrooms and they're able to view something virtually. So those are the conversations for all of the cuts. We can't uh, make a guarantee right now of what that looks like tonight, but the work is, is um, being put there. So some of these recommendations aren't even including a full elimination. It could be a reduction of, so when you saw graduation, that of course, our, our goal right now, we are planning for face-to-face -face instruction in the fall. So we have to wait, of course, that's not our decision, that will be the governor's decision, but we are planning for face-to-face -face instruction in the fall. We also are, are planning the other two scenarios if that is the case. So with a graduation, we are planning for a face-to-face -face graduation, but we're looking at some costs that we could do differently. Traditionally, we've had multiple staff and security. Can we eliminate some of those costs? So the things that, you know, without all of the detail, I think that sometimes it's an assumption that we're eliminating completely, um, but it's really about how to do this creatively and being able to be flexible and pivot in the event, you know, a big piece beyond just the CARES Act, we anticipate uh, some federal stimulus money. We can't guarantee it, but we would think this is a, a, an issue across the country and schools need support in order to move forward. And I think that that came out in citizens comment by um, Mr. Uh, I think Seth mentioned that in his Burlo. citizens comment, the type Burlo. This is the time to reach out to our legislators when we think about how schools are funded. Um, we all just need to be vigilant and having these conversations with our legislators to say, um, we, we need that support uh, federally and by the state to continue to move forward. All of these cuts would be drastic. And if right now we think that we're experiencing this pain at $650, we can only imagine at $2,000, we wouldn't be able to exist. And um, we are at a time right now when our students, our employees, our communities need us most. Evidence by, you know, we're feeding our families right now. We're providing supports. We're, we're providing social emotional learning. And the only way that we're able to do that is by maintaining the programs that are so essential for our students. And Monica, thank you. And I thank you and, and the entire administration and 
all the, the participants in the various committees, because these are very difficult uh, decisions to be able to go to from the budget process. And there's a lot of work that's necessary to get us back to school and making sure that we're supporting the students. It's just as you go through this process, as we bring the information forward to the community, if we, we recognize that all of these, cha these, these things will affect students, there's, if, there's nothing here that does not touch a student in some way or another, but there's been great prioritization on these things to make the smallest impact as possible. And as you bring forward to the public hearing, if you can make sure that you can look at those things and as you have your conversations with the rest of uh, your teams, look for ways for us to be able to um, mitigate the suspension or reductions on these programs while still maintaining the core and the essence of, of what these activities are. Thank you. I do wanna take a time again, I mentioned it before, but I want to thank um, every person that has been involved in this process, our administrators, our building leaders, our program leaders, the board members and in, in individual board meetings. Once again, I cannot say enough, no cuts are easy. The way that we have chosen to classify these are by department and level so that you can see where these reductions are coming from. But this is by no means, you know, one, one group decided to make this reduction. This was a collective thought in, in the transformation process we talked about all of these from a 30,000 foot view of the entire pre-K 12 program. So this is a collective recommendation from um, all of our staff that was involved. And I appreciate their work on that, especially in a virtual environment that really did compromise or challenge us even further than we normally do. And um, I am appreciate to get here. Thank you. And I, I want to continue the congratulations. Um, I want to thank everybody for being proactive and not waiting and seeing. Um, I think we need to have these discussions now and be prepared for the best case scenario, the worst case scenario. And as has been mentioned multiple times, these are difficult cuts and we know that they're impacting students. Uh, Monica, I do truly appreciate the um, thoughts that you shared with regard to looking at some of those programs in a different way to meet the needs of students. So we're not saying these are going to be cuts and these are not going to be programs that are suspended. We will wait and see to see how we can service our students in a different way. And I appreciate you and your team looking at things um, in an innovative, creative way to do some of the things that our students need like the web and the link crew. Um, and I also appreciate you mentioning that uh, you know, class sizes are important, maintaining class sizes. Of course, we all want smaller class sizes, but this is not the time that we're, we can get that. So just to maintain what we have is critical and also not to lay off any staff. So I appreciate the hard work that everyone's put into this. This is painful at every level, but you guys have done an amazing job with explaining everything, looking at everything, and the thoroughness, thoroughness of the details and the explanation is much appreciated. So thank you to you and your team. Okay, um, if there are no other questions, comments on this, we will move to the Wayne Risa Enhancement Millage presentation. Okay, so um, just wanted to take uh, this time this evening um, for an informational presentation uh, about the Wayne County Regional Enhancement Education Millage. This millage actually will be on the ballot in November of 2020 as a renewal. If you recall, um, we participated in terms of our individual school district um, with voting yes to put this ballot um, initially when it was put on the ballot in uh, 2016 and our county overwhelmingly supported this enhancement millage. We are in five years, the year five of the six year millage. And so this will expire and this is a time to um, consider moving forward. I will share at this point, in order for this regional enhancement millage to go before the voters, districts representing over 51% of students in the county, must the boards must vote to support that. That has already happened here in Wayne County. So regardless of our board's position on the enhancement millage, this will be before our voters on November 2020. So we wanted to take an opportunity this evening to just remind our community what uh, this is that they will be considering, uh, give you as a board an opportunity to still share your perspective, your feedback, your voice, and you still will have an opportunity for a decision in support or disapproval of um, getting behind this, this regional millage. So we just wanna take some time to just talk about this, this, uh, this millage. 
um, looking through the light of uh, PCCS, our mission and vision, and, and how we're working to continue to provide a strong educational experience that propels each student to excellence. Of course, looking at our previous conversation, the challenges that we are having um, financially across the state, across the, the, the nation, um, looking for ways that we are able to, to help to support the funding for schools is something that is important to consider. When we look at the enhancement millage itself, just to remind people, what is this enhancement millage um, and why is this proposal coming forward? Uh, since Proposal A legislation in 1994, remember that was approved by the voters, previously schools were funded largely through local property taxes, but under Proposal A, most tax revenues from the schools went to the state and then schools began to receive a per pupil foundation allowance um, really to fund our operations. As we all are aware, um, our purple, per pupil foundation in Plymouth Canton is the lowest. We're currently $8,111 per student. Um, so it is the lowest in the state. Um, when we look at even the projections that we just discussed, $650 per student less will really be um, a, a dramatic cut for us in terms of our operating budgets. One method that we are allowed to constitutionally uh, go out to seek a millage is a regional enhancement millage. So we in Plymouth Canton are not allowed to go out for a regional enhancement millage for our individual district. But as a countywide basis, we could go out um, to in, during a general election or a special election to ask our voters for support of this millage. Next slide. Uh, in terms of the process, once again, it must be proposed on a countywide basis. So each individual school district is not allowed to do that individually. And as I shared um, already, on enough school districts, you have to have 51% of the students in the county. So, so far in Wayne County, we have enough districts that this renewal will be on the ballot in November of 2020. If it passes or fails, it does so by a countywide basis of a total vote. This is not by local communities. If approved, the money is collected by Wayne Risa and distributed equally to all constituent districts on a per student basis. Each district has local control over how the money is spent. There's a lot, uh, there's different flexibilities between a millage and a bond, and we'll talk about that a little later. So as a district, we will be given local uh, control over how uh, money is spent. When we look back to our original, the current uh, millage that we're under that passed in 2016, this was in the November 2016 ballot. Um, it had two mills that were levied over six years. That millage expires in 2021-2022. It generated approximately $360 per student for each Wayne County district. So when we talked about the cost of that, we as uh, community members are currently paying um, the potential of a proposed cost of a homeowner with a home value of $100,000 is about $8 per month. The question, why did school districts request to put this proposal before Wayne County in 2016? Um, really, the goal of all of our school districts are to provide um, a high quality education and wanting our students to be successful. And PCCS believed that this investment was crucial to honoring our mission and vision. From 2011 to 2015, school operating funds for districts in Wayne counties dropped by 485 million. And despite various budget stabilization measure, measures, including uh, concessions and freezing and reducing salaries and benefits, um, many districts were challenged over the years. We, we can remember um, life before our enhancement millage, which was completely uh, different uh, from the services that we have been successfully, be, we've been able to provide for our students in the last four years. There was a statewide school funding adequacy study that was conducted in 2018 this concluded that added investment in local schools was necessary to prepare students for success. We've talked about this a lot in all of our conversations around school finance and the, the importance of um, when we looked at the study, um, how much does it cost to adequately fund the education of a student in the state of Michigan? And our per pupil foundation being the lowest is about $1,500 less than what that recommendation was. So Wayne County school systems wanted to solve this funding gap and increase educational opportunities for all students, therefore went out to the voters in 2016. 
I talked earlier about the difference. Sometimes I think that um, there may be some confusion. Many people will say like, didn't we just go out for a bond issue? Well, these are two different um, areas. An enhancement millage is an additional local contribution to school operations that supports programs and services for students. The enhancement millage funding can be utilized as part of the district's general fund. So there's not the restrictions that you have with a bond issue. The enhancement millage is once again, something that we cannot do individually by law. This can only come forward on a county basis. A bond issue, however, is a mechanism for individual school districts to raise capital funds. These capital funds are very specific in how they can be used. This is technology, hardware, facility improvement, such as our roofs, our parking lots, equipment, boilers, water heaters, some of the wonderful investments that our community is supporting in terms of classroom furniture and expansion of buildings. These funds are audited and they must use, be used for specific capital improvement. So that is the difference between a bond and an enhancement millage. Debbie spoke to this uh, slide earlier uh, in her presentation, just looking at the school aid fund and um, how, how schools are funded. And you look at the highest percentage coming through uh, sales tax and individual income taxes. And of course, uh, right now, as we are uh, working through COVID-19 and, and, and stay at home orders, people are not out there spending money. And so that's why we're looking at such dire cuts to this current budget um, moving forward. Um, the actual numbers of the projections are $1.25 million shortfall to this current year's budget that we're in and another $1.1 billion for the 2020-21 school year. I shared this already when we look at our foundation allowance as a result of proposal A, we are receiving the lowest per pupil uh, foundation. So you see um, some of our neighboring districts, people that we benchmark ourselves against. Uh, they receive more per student and are not able to do more. We still have done such a remarkable job um, providing high quality educational experiences for our students. Um, we are fiscally responsible. I continue to be proud of the work that we do in this area, but by all means, 8111 and now 650 or, or more less per student is really a significant drain for our ability to move forward and educate students the way that we're accustomed to. I mentioned the adequacy study. This study was organized by the Michigan School Finance Research Collaborative. It was really designed to inform policy solutions to school funding problems like the one that we face here in Michigan. It was conducted by the two most experienced and nationally prominent consulting firms and researchers use both professional judgment and evidence-based methods. Um, the first uh, study um, was to incorporate charter schools as well. The drew on a, it drew on a, an input of 300 Michigan representatives. And there's a link there for people to familiarize themselves if they're not um, familiar right now with the details of the adequacy study. The biggest piece that we wanna take away from this adequacy study was the finding once again, if you move forward, Nick, with the next slide um, of the amount that it would cost to um, educate a student in the state of Michigan. That final cost was approximately 9,590. And then also look at, it, it was looking at some weighted adjustments to provide additional supports for uh, students uh, who receive special education services for English learners to really make sure that students are able to get what they need. Um, and when we look at that number, just at base cost, once again, if you think about that 9590, we're currently at 8111, approximately $1,500, $25 million more per year. Imagine what we could do with, with that type of money. Um, so that is still the, the research behind the how schools are funded in Michigan. Right now, there has not been a change. And unfortunately, due to COVID-19, we're actually looking at going back um, in terms of the wrong direction, I will say that, uh, an unsustainable direction. So when we look at the enhancement millage itself and the renewal that uh, would come forward, we wanna talk about the priorities for PCCS. Um, we are really able to supplement the drastic reductions projected for per pupil foundation allowance due to the impact of COVID-19 on our state. So if we think about right now, we're receiving approximately $7 million for the uh, year from enhancement millage. Um, 
if we are looking at a $19 million projected deficit for 2021, imagine that without an additional $7 million more dollars, we would seriously be making um, some, some more drastic cuts than we're being recommended to make this evening. Um, in PCCS, this has allowed us to retain high quality staff. Um, it's allowing us to enhance our, and preserve our programs and offerings for students, maintain class size prior to the enhancement millage, uh, during financially challenging times, we had to increase class size by one student, K-12. This allowed us to return to our original class size levels and uh, make redux reductions when feasible. It allows us the ability to support all of our learners and their learning styles. Um, we've had a, a, a multitude of supports that we've been able to provide for our students over the last few years due to this enhancement millage funding. Talking about how the money has been used, we really committed to being transparent with our community. We wanted to make sure that we provided um, annual updates on how we use the enhancement millage. Uh, we've given that capital improvement money to each of our schools. We've given them an allocation so that they have some local control on how the money has been spent. Um, once again, from the enhancement millage, all money is passed down to our local districts on an equal per student basis. And we have that opportunity to work together to say how we have utilized the funds. We've maintained um, uh, class size. Once again, as I talked about, we've been able to make some capital repairs in our schools, improve technology, improve school programs, support students with added needs and offer competitive salaries, which has been very important. We're dealing um, with a teacher shortage across our state. And so for the last four, four years, we've been able to um, reinstate steps, which I believe are the rights. It's all of us coming to this a uh, profession with the idea that we are going to move to the top. And for many years, our teachers were frozen and all of our staff and giving back concessions. And so this um, enhancement millage allowed us to, to right-size that and begin to, to honor uh, that work in terms of our salary and, and remaining competitive and hopefully continuing to draw high quality teachers to support the needs of our students. Some specific things I wanted to highlight in terms of our enhancement millage over the last few years, we've added social emotional learning supports for all students. I think that that is so key as we talk about even COVID-19, our families, our students, our staff, people are in crisis in our community. And we are so fortunate that we've been able to bring to our program additional social emotional learning supports, behavior specialists. And I think even though we're looking at all of these cuts right now, those services are going to be more important than ever as we help to, to, to bring a new normal and, and, and needed supports for, for our students that are currently in trauma. We've been able to get additional social workers, um, English learner teachers. Uh, if you remember, we changed our entire uh, elementary program when um, we used to have uh, one English language teacher in elementary and uh, we were meeting the needs with paraprofessionals. And so now we have, I believe, 13 um, en English language learner uh, teachers. And, and that has really been a great support for our students. Student support coordinators, behavior specialists, counselors at elementary schools, technology enhancements, Flexible classroom furniture, and this is prior to our bond. So we were looking some, you know, 50 year old furniture in our buildings. And so we were able to get some, some up-to-date flexible furniture to meet the needs of our students. And we'll be able to continue to do that work, of course, moving forward with our bond. Classroom libraries, as, we, as we've gone to the readers workshop, making sure that we have new fresh um, uh, books or new materials within not only the libraries, but within our classrooms so that students have a rich choice uh, to read in terms of personalized selections. And uh, finally, some high quality professional development opportunities for our educators. I want to be very clear that we have grown, um, we are very grateful and have grown accustomed to the supports that these additions have provided for our students. But these supports would all be reduced without the enhancement millage being able to be removed, uh, renewed moving forward. So as we wrap up here, just want to talk about the renewal by numbers. Uh, currently in Plymouth Canton, our most recent official count was 17,368 students. Um, in 2018, our 2018-19 distribution, you'll see we received approximately $7 million from the enhancement millage. One change in the legislation now is that enhancement millage funds must be distributed to charter schools um, upon this renewal. So this would be in the 2022-23 if that passes. 
Um, the same amount of money would be then uh, distributed to charter schools. So our projected uh, distribution in 22-23 would be $5.4 million as opposed to the $7 million that we're currently receiving. Although that would be a rejection, uh, reduction, not a rejection, a reduction. Um, if you still look at those numbers, that's still, um, if it doesn't pass, we're receiving, we're reducing by 7 million. If it does, we are able to receive 5.4 million moving forward. Just other facts, I've kind of talked through some of these just behind the original idea to put this proposal on the ballot in 2016, looking at the importance of the adequacy study, saying that we need more money to fund all of our students and their, and their differing needs. When we looked at a federal study, Michigan is down 7.5% since 2008 in inflation adjusted per student funding. And other studies conclude that Michigan school finance system creates difficulties for districts experiencing declining enrollment. And we've talked oftentimes about this is a birth rate issue. There are just less stu students being born in the state of Michigan. And so we do receive our funding by per pupil in each year there is a projected decline just because less students are being born. When we look about the facts in Wayne County, the percentage of students living in poverty in Wayne County is 43% versus 17% statewide. And from 1999 to 2011, poverty in Wayne County is up from 21% to 38%. This trend has grown since 2016. When we look at English language learners in Wayne County, 20,766 in 2010 and now 30,000 085 in 2015, and those numbers have grown since that time as well. The next question for your discussion as a board is should our community, community consider renewing the millage when it expires in 2021-22? I will reiterate, PCCS will lose roughly, roughly 7 million if the millage is not renewed. Now that charter schools would be eligible for the millage upon renewal, PCCS would gain approximately 5 million. The school funding system at the state level has been ranked the worst in the country for the past 20 plus years and has not substantially changed. And unfortunately, due to our current pandemic, um, it will not, it, it will get worse uh, going forward for at least this, this upcoming year. So based on step, state law, a renewal would have to be voted on in 2020 or 2022, which would be after the ex expiration. So when people ask the question, why now? That is the, why the county has made that decision to move forward. So with that, I wanna just share for any additional information that people or questions that people may have, uh, Nick Brandon or Frank Ruggiero, their information is there. We will also have an active uh, link from Wayne Risa that will continue to be an FAQ page and answer questions as well. And we will share that. Uh, so I wanna, um, open up the floor right now to comments and questions from board members. And um, eventually we will have a conversation. As I said, at this point, this will be on the ballot in November of 2020, but here locally, you as a board uh, still have an opportunity to, to take a stand for or against. And so that's something we'd like to discuss, discuss this evening and talk about um, when you would like to, to make a decision on that next step. So questions. Monica, before we open up to questions, um, I just want to have you restate the numbers for the budget shortfalls for this year and next year. Because I think I heard you say million. Um, billion. Should be billion. Billion, yes. Yeah. So when we look at the state, so thank you for that clarification. $1.25 billion shortfall for the current year that we're sitting in. If you recall, we were um, actually directed to pay um, our staffs for the entire year. But now as we're getting to the end of the year, the projection is a 1.25 billion shortfall for this current budget year. And then for the 2021 projected to be a $1.1 billion shortfall. So thank you for that correction, billion. Great. And thank you for the great overview. And uh, you know, as board members, as we look for advocacy, there's this is an opportunity for us to um, advocate on behalf of our community, as well as you'll see a resolution in a little bit that we'll have a discussion around advocate, advocating for um, our students. So at this point, um, I think I saw a member McCoy's hand up. Just unmute myself. Okay. Um, so we're not voting on this. We're just discussing it tonight. 
Is this correct? Okay. Um, I think that with, I think we need to keep in mind that one of our goals as a board has been to um, close our achievement gap. And um, with the number of children who are going to be coming back to school who have been experiencing trauma during this time, with our English learners who are population which is growing, um, I'm not sure how we would be able to support our students if we don't, if we lose all of this money, considering the budget shortfalls that are already being projected. Um, I would hate to see us have to cut these supports to um, any of our students, but especially to our most vulnerable learners. Um, now we, we cannot, a good conscience, we, we cannot cut, we cannot cut support to some of these students or any of our students. So, um, and this is really our only option to get unencumbered money into the district. So if one, and we have to vote on this, I am certainly in favor of supporting this millage, even though I am against the fact that we have to share it now with charter schools, um, getting in $5 million is better than nothing. Thank you for that. Uh, Member Kehoe? Sorry to echo um, Member McCoy's uh, statements. I mean, this is this money has made a huge difference in the things that we're trying to do to be able to uh, decrease that achievement gap and to support our students with social and emotional learning and has really enabled us to both support our educators as well as provide the necessary resources to help support all of our students across the district. Not having this money would be really, really devastating to us. As we look at the budget cuts that we're trying to deal with this year and the plan use of fund balance, this is not sustainable for us. We've, we've been good fiscal stewards of the community's uh, um, support with the Risa Millage, and we've been able to hold some of that money uh, in place. We're using up that rainy day fund that we had from that Risa Millage uh, to support the, the, the proposed next year's uh, budget shortfall. This is something that's really imperative for the community to support. And this is one of the few areas that our local community has local control where they can actually make the decision to put money and invest into our students, as well as the rest of the students in Wayne County. And we think that all of those students deserve uh, a great public education. And we hope that someday our legislators in Lansing uh, as a group will vote to fund us at, the, at, at a minimum at the adequacy level, not the great level, but an adequate level. But until that times, this is something that's necessary for us to do as a, uh, as a community to support this process. And I'm wholly in favor of advocating that we as a board adopt a resolution in support of this process. Thank you, Member Kehoe. Other Member Borninski. So um, I'm gonna sound a little wishy-washy, um, unfortunately. I have a lot of thoughts about this. Um, First of all, I wanted to make sure um, that all the all of the board knows that um, at the whatever it's called the conference committee, the revenue estimating conference, um, there was talk. I mean, uh, Monica mentioned the sh budget shortfall for this this school year, and so the, at that conference, there was talk about the possibility of taking money away from districts this year. Um, I was on a call with uh, State Representative Matt Colazar and he told um, several of us that. Um, hoping that that doesn't happen, he didn't think it would, but just to have it out there so everybody knows that that, that was discussed. Um, so going back to the enhancement millage, um, I, I too have the same concerns about our own students, um, but I also worry about our families. And we did just pass a bond, which was wonderful. Um, so glad that the community supported us. But unfortunately, immediately after we 
found out that the bond passed, Michigan had its first couple cases of COVID-19. Um, and so the situation has changed for a lot of our families. And I know that there have been a lot of people who have lost jobs or have been furloughed. And so I am concerned about putting more tax burden on our families. Um, so I, I am not sure where I'm at yet. I still have to think about it and um, think about, you know, weighing everything. Um, so I still need some time to think about it, I guess is what I'm saying. Thank you. Thank you. And I just wanna echo uh, what Member Kehoe said that with regard to us passing the bond, um, and we are so grateful to, for the community in doing that, um, that that money is restricted. Um, and so the, the Wayne Reese Enhancement Millage funds would give us the flexibility we need to continue doing the work that we are doing. In addition to maintaining some of the programs, as Member Kehoe said, I, if we don't advocate for that, we will see such drastic cuts that I cannot even imagine at this point. And I, and I totally understand that our, some of our families are hurting, including my, our own home. We are uh, having to deal with some cuts. Um, and again, this is gonna be a hard decision all over uh, within the community. I've also heard from lots of parents who have continued to email and um, share their interest in supporting our school district. And many have said, what can I do? Um, some of the parents have even talked about having a fundraiser to support some of the projected um, suspension of programs because our community believes in our kids that much. And I hope that our community comes together and says, we need this more than ever now. And we have to figure out a way to do this. And again, until the state figures out how to adequately fund our, our programs, our kids and what they need, we have to continue relying on our community. And for that, I'm very thankful that we have been um, blessed with a supportive community and they have continued to turn out for us over and over again. And I know that the, this does pose um, some challenges for some families, but I hope that with this, as well as some of the other advocacy work that we can do to get more funding from the federal level, that we will come out of this better than what we are thinking about right now. Uh, Member Kehoe? Just to echo what you just said, um, Anup Homan, not, not to be callous. I understand that students uh, and families are, are experiencing financial constraints right now. But when I look at the money that this recent millage uh, raises, and I look at the cost to individual families as part of the process, I consider this to be an investment. And I don't think there's any better investment for what we could do for our community than invest in our students and to make sure that they're supported and, um, and educated and that they're really the future of what we're doing. And I appreciate the opportunity that we have. And I think that this is one of the best places for us to put those extra costs. And I know how hard this is and I know how difficult it is. And I know that our community through thick and thin has come out to, to continue to support us. And I hope that they continue to do that. Thank you. Other board members, comments, questions? Okay, if you have any other thoughts, questions, comments, please feel free to email Monica and I with those questions and we will bring this up at the next board meeting uh, for a vote. Um, we are now moving on to part three of our agenda with teaching and learning, and we do have an action item. Uh, so before we start that discussion, I would like to have a motion at the table for action item number 20-05-56. Member Kehoe? Madam President, I move that we consider action item 20-05-56, a resolution to purchase elementary school math curriculum resources, first and final reading. Second. Thank you. Motion was made by member Kehoe and seconded by member Brooks. Okay, Beth, would you like to walk us through that? Certainly, and I recognize that after having really difficult budget conversations, coming forth with a proposal that asks for some funding 
um, is challenging. So I wanna preface, preface with some reasons why we're still bringing this forward. First and foremost, this math curriculum resources purchase, it's earmarked already out of this year's budget. It was a planned use of budget for this year. Um, it includes online resources that we don't, do not currently have, and I'll walk through that in a few minutes. As we look at the fall and the unknown of how much we may need to do a hybrid model or a virtual learning model, it's imperative that we have some virtual resources to support both our students and our teachers. And also you saw in the budget proposal, um, the budget ideas, um, an ongoing savings of $100,000 annually in math consumables, that would occur based on this purchase. So I'm gonna walk us through now the proposed resolution to purchase elementary school math curriculum resources. We're very pleased to share the process and rationale that was used to select a new curriculum resource for elementary mathematics. Our current resource is an outdated version of everyday math that predates the adoption of the Michigan State Standards in 2010. While our everyday math resource does have some add-ons that provide and align more properly with the new standards, many of the standards and practices are not adequately covered without teachers needing to provide a, a lot of additional supplemental content. Our student performance data in this area has shown consistently over time that this type of patched approach has not provided the curriculum needed for our students to be successful with the math standards. Specifically, student achievement data shows a decline overall with student proficiency in mathematics. Additionally, our data shows students within subgroups continue to be less proficient than their non-subgroup peers. Based on the curriculum review process and our student achievement data, a change in our K-5 math resources is necessary. There were several goals that we had in, in mind for reviewing resources for the elementary math instruction purchase. They were alignment to state standards, alignment with the eight mathematical practices within those state standards, culturally relevant and engaging materials for students, and differentiation opportunities for our learners who struggle with the content or for our advanced learners. The elementary math committee reviewed eight different options, narrowing it down to two resources to be piloted during the 2019-2020 school year. With input from 125 piloting teachers and committee members, which included teachers at all 14 elementaries, elementary instructional coaches, the district English learner instructional coach, assistive technology integrationists, special education teachers, and a district technology integration specialist, we are bringing forward the recommendation to ad adopt Envision Mathematics 2020. Envision Mathematics 2020 not only has direct alignment with the Common Core Mathematical Standards, but it also integrates the eight mathematical practices within all lessons and activities. Qualitative and quantitative data that we collected showed that Envision provided differentiation for all of our learners, keeping students engaged and growing toward proficiency. Additionally, initial growth data on the NWEA demonstrated that 13 out of the 18 data points showed that students were able to have a more consistent learning experience across the district. What this means is that um, our subgroups didn't have a wide range of scores. They were tight together, which gives us positive thoughts about how this will support all of our learners. The cost for purchasing Envision Mathematics 2020 for elementary students are detailed in this chart. 51 teachers at kindergarten would be $120,122.37. 51 first grades, 121,367.43. 62 second grades, 157,988.37. 65 third grades, 168,264.81. 54 fourth grades at 134,518.47. 55 fifth grades at 136,180.01 and four sixth grades, which is to help support our fifth grade TAG program, $13,162.04. Shipping and handling fees, the total for this purchase would be $894,183.68. So the total cost is that, and this total includes a classroom set of textbooks, along with five-year digital access to the programs for all students and all teachers. So I'll stop there now and um, also bring in Dr. Brady and we'll answer any questions that you have. Thank you, Member Kehoe. 
What's the cost for additional digital access after the five years? It seems like our last set of textbooks we use for more than 10 years. Good evening, everyone. Um, so right now, a, the online component goes with um, what we purchase for the for the workbook for the student. So it was, it's actually not an additional cost. It is woven in with um, the workbooks. At the time that we purchased the current resource, that um, that was not something that I know of that was being done. Right now, our current resource does not. Um, is not supported online because of the date of how old it is. So that's why we don't have a current online um, component. Yep. I understand, but after the five years is expired, yep. what's it going to cost us again? It so it's about 80, it's a, for, for five years per student, it's about $85, $86. So right now that's the pricing that we get, which is a break um, because we're doing five years. So it's about $17, $18 a year for the workbook plus um, plus the online access. But in five years from now, though, I don't know what that cost would be, but approximately. Okay, so will the the, the workbooks, will we have to purchase additional workbooks each year? Or um, at the end of the five years, will we need to buy additional workbooks? And we can, or, or can we continue to use these same workbooks and just purchase additional electronic uh, licenses for those uh, if we, in the sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth year, et cetera. We will need new workbooks because they are consumables. Students write in them. So after five years, um, which is the cycle, right? We, are, we do a five-year cycle. So when we get back to where we are, we'll make sure that this is still the appropriate resource for us okay. and it's working based on the data. Um, and then, then typically what would occur is if we maintain the resource, we would then renegotiate with the company to do another multi-year bid so that we get um, cost save for doing multi-year. So, so just to reiterate then, this is not a purchase of an asset like a textbook has historically been. This is a subscription that we're buying where we get consumables each year as well as digital access for each year that we're doing this. At the elementary level, the math has always been this format. We do not have um, a textbook um, like you would traditionally think of a textbook, that's more secondary. The elementary doesn't necessarily work in that way um, every single time. Okay. And so is this the same way that we've been doing it? Because you said the materials that we were using before were from before 2010. So were that we is, buying new workbooks every year? Yes. that's So the $100,000 that, that you saw from earlier during the budget conversation, that mm -hmm. money is what has been being used to purchase the workbooks for our current math resource. So we don't need that $100,000 over the next few years because we are already doing a five-year bid to make sure that we have those materials. Um, so yes, that is something that, that the district has been doing every year since they originally um, got everyday math. Perfect. Perfect. Thank you for explaining that. So You're welcome. You know, in, in five years, we'll have our new curriculum cycle. This material may be the same material that we use, or we may choose to use something different. Regardless, we're going to have to buy new processes at that time. We're just, we're taking advantage of an economy of scale based upon our five-year curriculum cycle and locking in a discount for that multi-year. That is correct. It is a large cost save instead of doing it year to year, or even four year, for example. Um, it, it is a definite cost save to do it in this way. Okay. And I noticed in the price quotes, there's something listed as free quantity. Can you explain the difference between the charge quantities and the free quantities that are listed in the price quotes? Yes. So when um, my, my team and I work with vendors, we always, um, we always try to work with them to do the best deal, right? That's going to be fortuitous for the district in order um, to be fiscally responsible. So what you will notice, Nick, if you could go down just a little bit further for me, a little bit right there. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you. So that very top one, this is for kindergarten. You'll see the 8547. That's the multi-year. You'll see it says five-year subscription, five-year digital. That's the five years of workbook. That's the student edition. Um, and then below that, you'll notice that there's a practice workbook that um, teachers might be needing additional pieces for. So what you, you see underneath that are there's resource masters, addition, we're getting all of those items free from Pearson. That is part of what they, we worked with them on when, when we discussed um, doing a multi-year. So they're, they're actually, 
I didn't add all those pieces up, but if you notice, they're copying us actually quite a quite quite a bit of, of resources. A lot of them are the teacher materials um, that they're giving to us for free. Okay. And then the last question is, are these consumables that we're buying, the consumables just for this year or for all five years? It's a th that pricing is for all five years. So okay, you'll see. So, so we're spending nine hundred and some odd thousand dollars for five years total. We won't have consumables that we need to buy again next year. That is correct. Okay. Great. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Um, I also want to add that this was brought forward um, at the SPA meeting that we had virtually and board members got a chance to review some of the um, interactive materials. And I have to say, you know, given the situation that we're in, not knowing whether we're going to be face to face, hybrid, virtual, I feel like the way that these um, resources have been set up and designed really allow the teachers to have the flexibility and to allow students to learn in different ways. And we talk about you know, the, the tiered instruction and that's all included in here, uh, different languages, the read aloud, differentiation. I was really pleased to see that this package includes all of those resources that teachers can then tap into and have students go through and utilize the materials that they need. So hopefully it'll be a huge time saving for, for teachers, as well as engaging and continued learning for students so they're not getting bits and pieces from all over the place. So um, I think this is a, a good move and, and perfect timing in terms of what kids and teachers need. And I know it's expensive, but I feel like again, we have to do what we can to preserve the best quality education and materials possible um, at this at this time. I'm wondering so, if I could piggyback on that just to explain yeah. something. Um, one of one of the components that was that that helped us make the decision for this is the resource. We're teaching um, videos that come along inside of the online space, and so students who might need to review what was taught during the day can go to these little videos. There's characters that go through it, which um, multicultural um, characters, it's, they're, they're lovely. And so students can hear it one more time. Parents can hear it, right? Because sometimes, you know, parents are like, I'm not sure what you're supposed to be doing. And all those videos kind of offer that support. And to your point, um, every single day, every single lesson has multiple layers and levels. And it also has project-based, um, learning that can occur along along with the workbook kinds of pieces that go. So there, there's a, a lot of different factors that come in with within this resource that our current resource does not have. Um, other questions, comments from board members? Yes, member McCoy. I, I just wanted to point out that uh, the everyday math was originally started when my my children who are graduated from college for several years, were in elementary school. So that's been around for a long time. And I'm, I'm really glad to see that you spent the time really trying to find the best resources for our students, especially having to perhaps move into a hybrid model or virtual. Now is not the time to not have quality resources in the hands of our students and teachers. So thank you so much for your work. Thank you, Member McCoy. Member Kehoe? One, one more question on that, that subject. I know that in our proposed budget that we're doing and some of the plans and actions, we've deferred some textbook purchases next year. And it's nearly a million dollars, about the same amount that we're dealing with here. What, what makes those textbooks different um, and the things that we were considering as part of that process from this everyday, or I'm sorry, this elementary math curriculum? Um, I, I just need a clarification, Member Kehoe. So are you speaking of what would I have been purchasing with the million dollars that we are deferring? That's correct. Okay. So I'm going to talk just a, just briefly about what would have been in the curriculum cycle that we might not be able to, to get to. So, um, and, you know, I'm not with you, so I don't have my cycle to, to show you, but um, I have that beautiful chart that I keep showing you that mm -hmm. shows what's coming up. And we have um, some elective components, PE um, was slated to start curriculum work this coming year. Um, some of the pieces um, that we currently have that are right in the middle of their curriculum cycle, we might have to defer some of those pieces. We have 
some more high school ELA work that's being done. Um, so, so those are some of those things um, that we'll have to, we'll have to wait until hopefully the following maybe July when that 21-22 school year would be started when we could purchase items. So we, we plan on still working on curriculum this year. That, that doesn't stop, but when we can purchase things might just be put off for a little bit. So I understand that. And I know that all these proposed uh, cuts that we're doing will, will have a negative impact and they're not the things that we want to do. But it sounds like the things that, in your opinion, the things that we were considering for that next cycle are not as impactful as this particular uh, elementary curriculum, that this was significantly out of date and it didn't have the necessary electronic resources that we'd need going forward. That's why we're bringing this forward right now, but we're deferring the million dollars for next year. So I, so right now I don't have something else ready to bring to you. So remember, I, I, I like my timing and my long range planning and, and I like to hit things at certain times so that we're not trying to hit a budget all at the same time. So it might be things that I would be bringing to you more of March, April of next year that I'm going to have to defer hopefully until the July-ish timeframe. So hopefully it's not, um, it, we're going to be okay. Curriculum work will continue to move on. My team will continue to do what they need to do. We will continue to support teachers, to help students, and we might just have to defer hopefully for a few months before we can do the purchasing. Okay. And just in the... If, if in the heaven forbid situation, we don't see next year as a one-time uh, thing, you're okay with the decisions that you're making and that these are the right things to do right now? I wouldn't be bringing them to you for sure if I didn't think they were the right things to do. The elementary math program is in, is in dire need of new resources yeah, that, to that's, Ember McCoy's point. Right, that's what I thought you said. And I just wanted yeah. to make sure that there, we weren't seeing the same situation with the materials that we're deferring for next year. You, you, you don't see the same dire situation with the things. And obviously, you're in the middle of your curriculum cycle, so you Correct. don't know for sure, but you still have a pretty good sense for wh where, where we're at with those programs that you're looking at for next cycle. We, then, and we, we have items. So a lot of our things, as I've come to you over the last two years, um, I've shared that we have a lot of things that need, need to be looked at across time, but we also need to put priorities to make sure students emotionally are taken care of and the things that we have rolled out are, are done well. And so for me right now, my priority would be making sure the things we've already rolled out continue to move forward. We can't let those slide, do full implementation of the things we already have in process. And if we have to take a small hiatus on the other pieces, we'll be okay. Okay. We'll be okay. Thank you for that clarity. You're welcome. Well, additionally, we'll be looking at, you know, we'll still continue curriculum work. There's also um, openly licensed resources that we can look at as well. So, you know, it's really looking at maximizing what we can do and then deferring what the things that are still important, but not as critical as, as this one is at this point in time. Okay, that makes sense. Thank you very much. Other, yes, Member Borninski. Yes, so, um... My oldest is now 25 and he was in first grade in the year 2000 and they did everyday math. Um, so another, again, um, reinforcing how, how long we've been doing everyday math. And um, while it's a, it was a good program um, when, <laughs> when uh, my son started it in 2000, um, but you know, like all things, things change and we need to keep up. Um, I was, you know, like, like um, Ms. Rail said, this is really a difficult thing to do right after having that serious talk about the budget. Um, and I have been thinking about it a lot over the last few days. Um, but since everyday math, which we're currently using, really doesn't have an online component and we may be doing virtual school for some time, um, it's all unknown right now, but we have to, we have to be ready for that. Um, I am comfortable with going forward with this. Um, Again, you know, it, it's a it's a difficult thing right now in the position we're in. But um, 
we have to make sure that we're supporting our kids. And if we don't have resources for them to use at home, this it's, it's really going to be difficult for them to learn um, up to their potential and to understand the concepts. And I think also parents need that support too of um, being able to access the videos because I know when I was trying to teach my kids at home <laughs> um, their homework and looking at how to do lattice multiplication, I needed a lot of help myself. So um, <laughs> Patty's laughing because she knows about lattice multiplication, which is not a lot of fun for those of us who learned it the traditional way. Um, anyway, I just, I, I really think that this is going to be very helpful for our students in the, in the next year. Thank you. Other questions, comments? Okay, uh, to uh, Beth's point, I just wanna uh, point out, Beth mentioned looking at open education resources. And um, for those of you that know me in different uh, lives of Wayne Reese and everything else I've done at the state level, I'm a huge advocate of open education resources. Um, but I also see the time that it takes to create good um, quality instructional materials and experiences for kids. Uh, the time, the energy, the coordination, knowing the situation that we're in now and knowing what this program offers is, again, I think this is where you have to make those tough decisions to say, we cannot do anything better with what we have in the time frame that we have than what we're getting from this um, publishing company. And we also know that um, kids learn in different ways and we continue to teach in those old ways with um, the, the textbooks. And then we ask teachers to come up with creative ways to create the videos or come up with experiences. Again, that's a lot of um, pressure on teachers to continue creating those instructional materials on their own. My hope is that when we alleviate some of that pressure for teachers, in not having to create those additional supplementary materials or resources, they can then devote that time to really facilitating and having those meaningful interactions and engaging conversations with kids so that we are really getting into the heart of teaching and learning. So we're removing many of those barriers with this um, big package and a complete package that I'm seeing. So uh, as someone mentioned, I appreciate the thoroughness of the committee in looking at the materials and bringing forward a quality uh, resource from the brief glimpse that we had at the spot meeting. So uh, if we have no other questions, comments, um, I would like to have member Brooks do a roll call vote since this is a first and final. Yes, okay. <clears throat> um, okay, member Berninski. Yes. Member Brooks, yes. Member Kehoe? Yes. Member Lazarowitz? Yes. Member McCoin? Aye, uh, yes. Member Savage? Yes. Member Sadu? Yes. Okay, motion passes 7 0 for action item number 20 05 56. Resolution to approve purchase of elementary school math curriculum resources, first and final reading. Thank you. Thank you. We are now moving on to part E of our agenda, action items and discussions. And we have an action item up. Uh, so I would like to have somebody make a motion for action item number 20-05-57. Member Berninski. Madam President, I move that we approve the Cooperative Education Program Agreement. Um, and the action item number is 200557, I think. Okay. okay, motion was made by member Berninski. Member Kehoe? Uh, support. Thank you, and seconded by member Kehoe. And uh, who's going to walk us through that? Monica, are you gonna walk us through that one? Yes, I can quickly walk you through. Um, this is an annual agreement. Um, this is a renewal that we have with Livonia Public Schools. This is for the Career Technical Education Program. So we have 
um, it's really a, a great shared service so that some of our students have an opportunity to participate in classes that are offered through the career technical education program with Livonia schools that we don't offer here in Plymouth Canton. Um, uh, with this program, we have this um, automatic renewal each year. We come before the board to continue to agree. We get our own foundation allowance for our students, but then they invoice us for that um, proration of the time that our students take uh, classes within their program. So each year we bring this forward for consideration. Um, the Livonia uh, Public Schools uh, brought it to their board and approved this um, at their meeting. Uh, I believe it was the 27th day of April. And uh, so we're bringing it forward for your consideration this evening. Okay, questions, comments? This is a pretty routine thing for us, so, um, but I would welcome any questions, comments, if board members have any. Okay, hearing none. Member Brooks, would you like to please walk us through the roll call vote? Yes. Um, first one is uh, Member Berninski. Yes. Member Brooks, yes. Member Kehoe? Yes. Member Lazarowitz? Yes. Member McCoy? Yes. Member Savage? Yes. Member Sadu? Yes. Thank you. Motion passes 7-0 for action item number 20-05-57. Consider approval of a resolution for a cooperative education program between Livonia Public Schools and Plymouth Canton Community Schools for the 2020-2021 school year first and final reading. Thank you. Okay, that takes us to our next uh, discussion item. Uh, consider approval of resolution regarding funding. Um, so as we've heard, we're looking at huge losses that will have a profound impact on our programs, students, families, and staff. Uh, the district has looked at every opportunity to propose cuts for the next school year based on cost and safety. Uh, knowing that most of the funding comes from the state in this form of a per people foundation allowance, and it does not adequately fund our programs to support what our students need and deserve, we have to do something. So the projected losses due to this pandemic are unimaginable as we've been discussing. We cannot bear these losses alone and we need to advocate for additional funding. You heard Monica talk about the uh, projected 1.25 billion from this year and another 1.1 for next year. Those are huge losses for education. And we've talked about many painful cuts and are tapping into our general fund balance for which we are grateful to help minimize some of that pain. Imagine if we didn't have the healthy fund balance. And that goes back to uh, another conversation we had with regard to the Risa Millage and going um, after a renewal of that. Um, as we've been thinking a lot about this, I feel like just as we were beginning to rise from the downfall of the 2008-9 recession, we get hit with a bigger hammer over this pandemic in which we've not been able to completely control or comprehend. And during this meeting, we heard multiple times that we need to contact our local, state, and federal legislators. Here's an opportunity for us to stand together and stand up for funding to preserve educational services for children. So with that said, I'd like to um, open up a discussion for a resolution that you have had an opportunity to read over the weekend and ask um, questions, comments. Madam President. Yes, Member Kehoe. Rather than a discussion, I'd move that we adopt this as a first and final reading. Are other members comfortable with that and getting an action item for first and final read? Yes. Member Borninski? Yes, I'm comfortable with that. Any objections to making this a first and final read? No. Okay. Uh, so Monica, do we can we get Diane to give us an action item number for this one? Yes. Uh, Diane, can you let us know the action item number? Madam President, the action item number for the resolution regarding funding to preserve educational services for children will be 200558. Okay. So with that said, and we'll make this a first and final, can I have a motion? Yes, Member Kehoe. Madam President, I'm, I move that we 
consider a resolution regarding funding to preserve educational services for children, action item 20-05-58, first and final reading. Second. Thank you. Motion was made by member Brooks, seconded oh. by member, I'm sorry, motion was made by member Kehoe, seconded by member Brooks, correct? Okay. Yes. All right, uh, discussion, questions? Yes, member Kehoe, and then we'll go to member McQuain. Yes. So I mean, I think this is um, something where we're asking our national legislature to support us in the same way that they've supported individuals and that they've supported large businesses and in some cases, small businesses throughout the country. I think that the, the federal government is the only entity that can issue bond obligations uh, or issue um, situations to go into a deficit spending in order to support the, the, the really important needs of the country. And they've demonstrated a willingness and ability to do that for some of the biggest com companies in the country. And I think that our students are just as important as those businesses. And I think this is really important for us to, uh, to do. Thank you. Member, I'm sorry, Member McQueen was next and then Member Borninsky. Um, yeah, so with seeing the budget shortfalls that they're projecting um, and then perhaps some for this year. And knowing all of the supports our students are going to continue to need into the future, um, I think it's really important that we ask for and expect to receive the same level of support um, as um, businesses have in the past. We can't, we can't balance the budgets on our school children um, because they are our future and they're not going to get these years back. So now is not the time to be asking schools to make cuts into programming and staff that are so critical to support our students, especially in the unknowns they've experienced and could be experiencing in the future. So I'm very much in support of this. All right, Member Berninski, you're up next. Thank you. So yes, I think this is really important. Um, I think that the current um, COVID-19 crisis has um, just proved and underscored that the way we um, fund our schools is not a good way to fund them. Um, and, uh, you know, it's a broken funding model. Um, I also think that schools provide an important stabilizing force in students' lives and children's lives. And um, it's really important for children and families that we have good, stable public schools. Um, I also, wanted to say that it's not just the federal government that needs to step up. Um, the state government needs to make schools a priority. And um, I understand that if we pass this resolution that we will be sending a copy of the resolution to our state and federal legislators. So I think that's excellent. Thank you. Other questions, comments? Yes, Member Brooks. Yeah, I just like to say that uh, now's a good time to let all of our state reps and all of our representation and um, um, the, the federal government know that um, we are very concerned about the funding for our school systems. And uh, we would like them to make an effort to fix the problem. Thank you. And I appreciate the um, urgency to make this first and final. The sooner we can get our voice heard, the better. So before we actually take a vote, um, would someone like to read the resolution? Member Borninsky? Thank you. Plymouth Canton Community Schools Board of Education, resolution regarding funding to preserve educational services for children. Whereas the COVID-19 pandemic has resulted in 1,528,235 confirmed cases and 91,664 deaths nationwide as of Wednesday, May 20th. 
whereas the pandemic has resulted in 53,009 confirmed cases and 5,060 deaths in Michigan as of Wednesday, May 20th. Whereas Michigan's first positive COVID-19 cases were on March 10th, 2020. Whereas in response, the governor announced school closures two days later on March 12th and a stay home, stay safe order on May March 23rd, among many other efforts to address this public health emergency. Whereas the public health emergency has had adverse economic and educational impacts on states across the country and on countries across the world, especially on those states and countries with significant numbers of individuals who've gotten sick from and or died from the virus. Whereas no state with significant numbers of individuals who have gotten sick from and or died from the virus can address the attendant effects without federal support. Whereas Congress has acknowledged this fact with the passage of coronavirus relief bills in the last two months. Whereas these bills, now law, while helpful and appreciated, are insufficient to shield our children and families from profound harm. And whereas no child asked to grow up in a pandemic and to the absolute extent possible, no child should be harmed in his or her education by the fact that he or she did grow up in part during a pandemic. Now therefore be it resolved that the mission, excuse me, now therefore be it resolved that the Plymouth Canton Community Schools Board of Education does hereby urge the Michigan State Legislature and the Michigan Congressional Delegation to support actively, individually, and collectively a bill to preserve educational services to Michigan school children that have been threatened as a result of this pandemic. And be it further resolved that the Plymouth Canton Community Schools Board of Education urges members of the state education community to share their related thoughts with members of the Michigan State Legislature and with members of the Michigan Congressional Delegation and to urge their national associations to share similarly with members of Congress. Presented at the May 26, 2020 Plymouth Canton Board of Education meeting. Thank you. At this point, we'll do a roll call vote. Yes, um, Member Bruninski? Yes. Member Brooks? Yes. Member Kehoe? Yes. Member Lozarowitz? Yes. Member McCoyne? Yes. Member Savage? Yes. Member Sadu? Yes. Motion passes 7 0 for action item number 20 05 58. Consider approval of a resolution regarding funding to preserve educational services for children first and final reading. Thank you board members for that united front. Um, Superintendent Mayor, did you wanna say anything? Did you wanna add anything? I disagree and I, uh... I agree. I know that sounded like I said disagree. I said I disagree. <laughs> and I appreciate um, the willingness of our board to move forward and just take a stand strongly advocating for what our students need and deserve. So um, just appreciate uh, you um, getting out in front of this issue um, and continuing to advocate for our students here in Plymouth Canton and across the state. Thank you. Okay, we are now um, at letter F, follow-up board questions. And we did not have any follow-up board questions from our last meeting. And uh, did we get any board questions that we need to follow up on from this meeting? I did not write any down. I, I did not hear any. So did anyone? Yeah, I, actually, I, I would like on the next, um, on the budget presentation, if the administration can talk about those programs that are being suspended and how we're going to be able to adapt to those things. Okay. So for example, uh, the, the link crew and the, the, the WEB program. Okay, noted. 
any other questions that came up during meet the meeting today that we need to address for next meeting? Okay, Diane, did you get that one? Yes, I did. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, before we end um, and do our adjournment, I just wanna remind people to contact their state and federal legislators and let them know we need additional funding as we've been talking about numerous times during the meeting today to offset these deep cuts. Our school system is a cornerstone of our community where all of our students are welcomed, educated, encouraged, they build friendships, they grow, explore passions, help each other, where we feed our students and families and we keep our Plymouth Canton community strong through developing well-rounded educational programs for students who grow up and do amazing things. We owe it to them to maintain our valuable programs and continue to build a strong educational system where they can continue to thrive. Right now, we're just seeing the tip of the iceberg if we do nothing with regard to the level of cuts that we're seeing. I encourage everyone to get involved and contact their local, state, and federal legislators to let them know how much you value the programs at Plymouth Canton and how much you value our students and their educational needs. I have received numerous emails and phone calls by parents saying, what can we do? Here is an opportunity for all of us to come together as a community to make sure that our voices are heard. Our students need additional support and flexibility moving forward so that we can come out of this stronger we know that things will look differently moving forward, but we have to do everything in our power to minimize the damage from such drastic budget shortfalls. We need additional state and federal support as was indicated numerous times today to make these cuts less painful in order to keep our students safe and be able to provide them with the educational support and services they need and deserve. This pandemic has made more visible the inequities at all levels in our society. It's going to widen the gap between the haves and the have nots. It's going to lead to a greater teacher shortage and that is one of my fears. We have to make our voices heard. Our schools need the stimulus funding to maintain being that cornerstone of our community. In addition, we need to work hard to pass the RESA enhancement millage since these funds have more flexibility to support our students' needs. We've seen what strong school districts do for our students and communities. We need to continue strengthening that and not weakening it. We need a stronger workforce that cannot happen if we keep cutting valuable programs. Our kids are watching on how we handle these tough situations. Let's come together and advocate for them and for the programs that benefit them. Let's continue to support each other and know that many around us are going through a tough time. We will get through this and become stronger and more resilient and more innovative. Thank you to our educators and community members for your ongoing hard work and support please continue to stay safe and we value you. And I, as Monica mentioned earlier, we cannot thank you enough, not just the teachers and the administrators, the food staff, bus drivers, the parents, the community members that have come out full force for everything that they do week over and over again to continue supporting our students. So I just wanted to say uh, there's a lot that we can do, even though it seems like we are in a really tough situation. And I know that as a community, we will rise above this, but this is an opportunity for us to come together and make sure that our voices are heard. If you feel like you're out there, you wanna do something, this is your opportunity. So that is um, all I have as we end. So we are at the time of the end of our agenda. Uh, there are no more agenda items. So I'm looking for a motion for an adjournment. Member Kehoe. Madam President, I move that we adjourn the meeting. Motion was made by Member Kehoe. I second it. Thank you. Seconded by Member Lazarowitz. All in favor, please. Actually, we don't need to do a roll call vote. We're at the end of the agenda. So we are going to end our meeting at 9.39. Thank you, everyone. Have a safe uh, night and stay safe out there. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks. Thank you.